Welcome everyone um, to our masterclass citizen science policy. Um, I suspect many of you will have joined us over the last uh, one and a half days and I feel like policy, the word policy is mentioned, has been mentioned a lot. Um, so it would, it's really great that now we have some time to really uh, go deeper into this um, topic. Um, let me go further in my uh, presentation. Um, so who's going to be speaking today? Um, it's going to be myself, I'm going to be moderating today. Um, and my colleague Inyo Nontemans will also be presenting. Um, we have Antonella Radicki from uh, Museum for Naturkunde. We have Molly Latham from Earthwatch Europe and also Suka Voigt uh, also from Museum for Naturkunde. Um, and uh, yeah, again, a great welcome to all of you. Um, and I'd like to uh, give the opportunity to Antonella first to uh, tell us a bit more about like how important has policy been in the project EU citizen science and how have you tried to um, address this important topic uh, within, your, within the project? Thank you very much, Anneli. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, satellite policy event on the behalf of the EU Citizen Science Project. And today I'm here uh, in my role of project manager of the EU Citizen Science. And also I represent the Museum for Naturkunde Berlin, uh, who has been the coordinator of this uh, project. The EU Citizen Science Project has uh, engaged a lot with the policy side of citizen science in several ways. I would like to give you three examples. So we have had uh, a, a dedicated pack, a work package uh, led by Earthwatch, who has been uh, who has produced a number of significant uh, best practices and uh, recommendations about how to raise awareness for policymakers in regard uh, to citizen science. And my colleague uh, Molly is going to uh, expand on this topic. Just to give you an, a couple of examples uh, of uh, guidelines uh, and recommendations, they span from establishing uh, your online presence uh, uh, with, with your projects and to, for example, um, designing your project uh, questions around uh, topics that are relevant for policymakers. Another way we have addressed um, citizen science for policymaking has been uh, by organizing high-level policy event uh, for uh, creating a space for conversations, um, putting together high-level uh, representatives, uh, policymakers, uh, for example, uh, within the context of the event we held in June, uh, Citizen Science for Policy Across Europe. And there we had representatives from the European Commission, from the Spanish and Germany and uh, German and uh, Portuguese uh, ministries talking about uh, challenges and um, potentialities for having citizen science uh, um, uh, on the top of the agenda of policymakers. And last but not least, uh, we have played an important role um, in the process, in the co-creative process, uh, which led to the writing of the SDG uh, declaration for uh, citizen science. Uh, which will be the core topic of Silk's, Silke's talk today. Uh, in other words, via the declaration, uh, we highlight the way uh, citizen science can uh, help and support for achieving uh, the progress towards the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you so much, uh, Antonella. It seems like uh, EU citizen science has really paid a great deal of attention to uh, the policy side as well. And I'm really eager to hear more about that um, in the two uh, presentations that will follow later. Um, so um, now you kind of have some idea, or at least <laughs> you've seen some faces of people um, that uh, will speak today. Um, but we would also really like to get to know you. 
Um, so we would encourage you uh, first to go into uh, the chat of this uh, of the stage. So on the right hand side uh, at, the bottom, at the top, I think you see uh, the chat for this uh, event. And we would like to know um, where where you are, basically, uh, what town, what city, what country, um, just to see kind of a bit of a <laughs> geographical spread of, of who we have uh, in the room. So please, uh, please go ahead and uh, type that. Always have uh, a bit of a delay, but I see uh, Austria, Brussels, Bristol, France, Amsterdam, some fellow Dutchies in the room, I see. Poland, Norway, Denmark, Paris, Ireland, wow. <laughs> It seems like we have all corners of Europe uh, covered so far, um, which is uh, really nice. Ah, Elena from Barcelona. Great, great to hear uh, where you're hopping in from. Um, then we would like to uh, also have two poll uh, questions. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you can see some questions in the Q&A section. Um, and um, the first one uh, we would like to ask uh, in the poll is, um, what do you consider yourself as? Uh, I mean, do you consider yourself working in the field of um, policy or perhaps citizen science, or science, or perhaps you're one of those people who kind of work in both um, or neither, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, do let us know in, in the poll. I'm not sure if I'm able to see it, to be honest, if I'm able to see your answers. Let's see, Amalia is uh, confirming that I can't see the answers, but that you guys can and you're filling it in. Um, it will have to remain a mystery to be uh, what, uh, what they are. Um, but hopefully uh, at some stage, uh, Inyo, when he starts his presentation or someone else um, can tell me uh, the results. Um, and then uh, I'd like to move on uh, to the next question. Um, is that, have you joined any of our other masterclasses, our policy masterclasses in the other countries? Uh, so for example, Netherlands, Norway, UK, Spain, or Italy. Uh, we have held these masterclasses before and we're wondering if perhaps you've already joined uh, from other countries. So please go ahead and uh, fill that out. Thank you so much, Alice, for, uh, for posting this. This is tremendously helpful. Um, as we can see for the first question, in any case, um, so many of you, and it's not a surprise, uh, have, are like purely from the citizen science uh, part. Um, quite a number of you are like both, consider yourself working in both uh, fields. 10% um, policymakers, that's definitely a good number. And some of you are uh, mystery others. Um, then for the other question, uh, yeah, perhaps uh, someone can uh, post the results as well. I have a few, I see some names that uh, definitely also that I recognize from other uh, countries. Um, so that's uh, really nice that you are able to join this one as well. And I'll give you just a few more seconds to answer the question, and then we will uh, 
you will move on. Okay. Um, so, as I said, we've been around, um, mostly not physically, uh, unfortunately. Uh, in most of the countries, we had to do online events. Um, but, however, in, in the south of Europe, we have been able to uh, travel. Um, Inu and I have been able to go to Barcelona to have our workshop there, and uh, Antonella Bassani has been able to lead the workshop in, uh, in Italy. Um, and now um, we're coming to Europe. Um, so what we want to do today is, uh, and actually in the whole um, uh, set of masterclasses, we want to mainstream citizen science in policy uh, throughout Europe. And today we're going to do that by, uh, first of all, sharing knowledge, um, develop both the action uh, project as well as the EU citizen science project on the interaction between uh, citizen science and policy. Um, we're also going to be discussing the recommendations uh, with each other. Uh, so we'll have time for interaction mostly in the second hour of today. Um, and the third uh, way of doing so is actually to connect policymakers and citizen science actors to boost future collaboration. Um, so while you're all here uh, and meeting each other and talking to each other, um, of course, we'll have uh, also an opportunity to connect to each other and find um, people that you may have not known before. So um, how are we going to do that? Um, first of all, uh, my colleague Inu Nozomans will uh, share his presentation on the recommendations to mainstream citizen science and policy. We're going to hear from Molly. Uh, we're going to hear from Silke. Um, and then the second hour, we're going to go into breakout sessions where you'll be able to choose which of the recommendations that Inyo has presented you'd like to uh, discuss, which you'd like to share your opinions on and talk to other people about. So uh, when you listen to his presentation, uh, pay attention um, and, uh, and choose your favorite one um, in the second hour. And at the end, we're going to come back to the stage um, and have some uh, plenary interaction and uh, closing of the event. So now um, the stage is yours, Inyo. Thanks, Anneli. Thank you very much for the introduction. Also, um, um, Antonella, thanks for introducing what you've been done. I'm really curious also to hear from uh, Molly and uh, Silke afterwards. Uh, and to learn also from you what you've been doing on um, the, the interaction of citizen science with policy. Um, it's really great to see so many of you, many recognizable names, at least, that I've seen in, in, our, in one of our policy masterclass, but also many new names, so welcome. Um, great to see so many of you. I will share with you what we've been doing in action in connection with policy. Um, mainly in the second half of what I will say, I will discuss those recommendations that have been buzzing around already. Uh, we'll be working on also in the breakouts. Um, um, but uh, I will also tell you where these uh, recommendations really came from. Um, and it was after the summer, as Anneli already said, after the last summer, we were, be, were able to do this physically, to have two physical masterclasses uh, here in Barcelona, for example. But before summer, um, we did three masterclasses online uh, where you also joined and look more like what we have today uh, and on the right side of, of the picture. Uh, that was in uh, the Netherlands, in Norway, and in the UK. But first, uh, let me just introduce what we have done, why we work on policy and citizen science, uh, what we've done in these uh, policy masterclasses, uh, because that's the basis of uh, the recommendations that I will share with you. I work at DRIFT, which is the Dutch Research Institute for Transition Studies. Uh, it's part of the Erasmus University, and we conduct research and uh, provide advice on sustainability transitions. And sustainability transitions uh, are a radical transformation towards a sustainable society in response to a number of persistent uh, problems facing modern society. And from that perspective, we started working, and I look also at citizen science, um, and I see that our current challenges, our societal challenges, are too great to be left only to scientists, uh, but also to policymakers alone. So we need more, and we need more diverse group of people who can use their capabilities, their, their creativity, uh, to develop responses to our major societal issues. Um, 
so I see that citizen science is a knowledge process or a method that has not been yet really institutionalized. Um, as Saverman also shared uh, uh, at all in, in, in their paper, um, while some see citizen science primarily as a means to increase the productivity of traditional scientific research, others see it as an opportunity to democratize science by opening up traditional institutions. And that's why I think we also started working on citizen science, but also why we started um, um, with policy. So the aim to work on policy in citizen science is to mainstream citizen science in policy. Uh, and we have done this by really co-creating actual knowledge uh, to strengthen the capacity of many actors. Uh, and in practical terms, what we've done is, uh, uh, we have done this by organizing five policy masterclasses, six including today, um, and by developing and sharing recommendations to mainstream also citizen science in policy. And the unique character of these, well, this process has been that we really try to bring citizen science and policy actors together. Um, when we started, we saw that uh, there were many resources focusing on how citizen scientists could reach out to policy. Um, that's really important. But I think we needed a next step as well to focus more on the policy side and the inter interaction between those two. Um, and that's also what we do today and we will share today in the um, uh, in the recommendations. A second unique character was the local uh, uh, character and the local connection. So we really tried to build capacity in specific contexts, really trying to connect with what was going on in the country or the specific area where we organized these masterclasses, giving local citizen science and policy uh, stakeholders really also a platform to interact uh, and to exchange. It was also co-creating processes by, by creating this actionable knowledge. So what you could really do um, where um, uh, we really connected to local needs of policymakers, uh, uh, policy workers, uh, citizen scientists, researchers to mainstream citizen science in policy. And lastly, uh, it was also really a network and capacity building of the local stakeholders, connecting them, but also putting this topic on the agenda. And based on what came out of these local co-creation, uh, the masterclasses, we have developed also our recommendations. So these recommendations are the result of the process that we did in these uh, uh, different five countries. Um, what we did is, is first we started with a general literature review on the interaction of citizen science with policy. And then per country, we started with a context scoping um, through interviews um, uh, and in two countries even did a focus group. Uh, and then with local stakeholders and also partners from Action, but also other partners we found, we developed the main focus and also an invitee list per country to come to a group of about 20 participants per, uh, uh, per masterclass. Um, and this in these masterclasses, there was really an interactive exchange, capacity and network building in, in breakouts, but also plenary presentations and exchange. Um, and based on that context scoping, the different inputs also from the masterclass, the notes, the discussions that we've had, uh, but also an evaluation that we sent afterwards, um, we, we uh, made recommendations per country, uh, about seven to 10 in each of the countries. Uh, and afterwards, um, uh, we analyzed what were the cross-cutting recommendations, themes that we saw emerging from all the different uh, uh, countries. Um, so that's the recommendations that we will share in a bit. And they're really based on the interaction and the co-creation with the people in these different countries. It's not made from a desk research, uh, but of course the framing, the analysis is ours and not uh, of the local uh, stakeholders. Um, the different countries where we, where we, where we have been, um, oh, I'm going too fast. Um, Anneli already shared uh, this picture with you briefly, but, uh, first, our first masterclass was in the Netherlands. Then we went to, uh, Norway uh, and the UK all online. And then we could move offline to Spain and Italy. Um, it was in a seven and a half month period. So we built upon these and also, uh, uh, really tried to have different focuses in the different countries. And also, I really want to say a special thank you. Also, I see a lot of names here again uh, to all the participants of these masterclasses, but also the people we have interviewed in the countries and our collaborating partners in each country. Um, because this has also been a collaborative effort, and especially also that was one of the outcomes of these masterclasses that we also put the network together. So zooming in a bit on the countries, what we did there before going into the recommendations, um, maybe tell you a bit who did we work with and what did we do in the different countries briefly. 
Um, in the Netherlands, uh, we did this together also with one of the partners, the Butterfly Association, um, uh, uh, but we also had contributions from other universities, um, the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment was part of it. Um, and this masterclass also really informed uh, the forming uh, uh, of a national citizen science platform, uh, which is under development. At the end, Anneli will also share some contact details for all these countries if you're interested also to join the discussions and the platforms that are emerging, have emerged uh, in the different uh, countries, but also in Europe. Um, in Norway, we had partners with NILU, uh, but also participants from other research institutes, the NTNU, Sintef, but also uh, municipalities like Oslo, Kristiansand. And we also really put citizen science on the on the national agenda or help that by boosting also the conversation towards forming this citizen science platform. In the UK, we work together with the Department for uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA. Um, we worked with researchers, uh, KCL, also our partners in action, but also citizen scientists um, working on questions from their network itself. Uh, really enabled them to ask questions and also discuss these uh, from cross-linking governmental efforts within the government to a discussion on fair funding. In Spain, we could finally move offline. Um, we collaborated with the Citizen Science Office in Barcelona, so had more a regional focus of Barcelona and uh, Catalonia, um, where they had to really the chance to physically network again, um, also together with an organization called BitLab Partner in Action. And then finally in Italy, uh, it was a connection of gathering of the Citizen Science Association there and really also worked on increasing the recognition of citizen science um, at the policy level and in public bodies. And then in the cross-cutting, so overall these uh, uh, different masterclasses, we have put citizen science uh, uh, on, the, on the policy agenda in the debates, but also put policy impact on the agenda of citizen science. Moving to the recommendations, um, maybe the this was how we came there, what we did in the policy masterclasses, but now we can talk about um, what we what we really say in these recommendations, the tangible outcomes of these masterclasses. So the cross-cutting themes from the national recommendations resulted also in this masterclass. And uh, they are based mainly on, on four of the five masterclasses. The Italian masterclass uh, analysis is still a bit on the development, but we already see that the themes of the recommendations also uh, resonate there. And the, the, the cross-cutting, uh, these overarching uh, recommendations are really not aimed at a European level necessarily, but provide insight in the common themes we observed in all of these countries and what came up also from these local contexts. And they are recommendations for policymakers, but also policy workers, citizen science actors and scientists uh, in order to mainstream citizen science in and align science with policy. We see that only in that interaction, citizen science can be really also mainstreamed in policy. And we call this policy workers, and that's anyone that works in policy, whether that is at a governmental organization uh, or an NGO or a knowledge institute, a company, uh, and thereby capturing also this whole policy ecosystem. Um, I think also for others, they can be interesting, these recommendations. Um, let's say something um, that comes up from all these countries and masterclasses uh, uh, and around the communities that we've engaged with. These can also have implications for coordinating activities at the European level. So let me go to the six recommendations. The first one is um, the first two recommendations. Each two recommendations are connected in, in an overarching, let's say, theme. The first theme is ensuring a healthy citizen science ecosystem. And the first recommendation is to fund citizen science with the goal to mainstream citizen science as a scientific method. And how can that be done? Citizen science is um, different from a lot of other scientific methods. So in funding, um, keep in mind that the relatively high startup costs uh, of citizen science are there, but also uh, have eye for the long-term uh, long term funding to keep citizen science and citizen scientists also engaged and on board when you develop the project uh, uh, further on. Think about compensation for non-university actors, um, but also in funding requirements, um, address the quality criteria of what good citizen science is and how you would like to see that. In data integration, look at um, uh, how that can be connected to policy data demands. Um, think about connecting it to societal challenges 
which help to link to the SDGs, for example. And lastly, stimulate also and reward scientists what, uh, that use uh, uh, participatory methods like citizen science. And this is mainly, I think, a recommendation for uh, research councils, but also uh, specific uh, policy departments or local governments uh, and institutions that also deal with science and uh, perhaps also citizen science. The second recommendation in this one is to set up uh, national or regional citizen science networks or platforms to connect citizen science actors and to facilitate also the knowledge exchange. This is more for the scientists and the citizen scientists um, among you, or, or but also policy workers can have a, a, a supportive role uh, as can universities and science institutes. And these networks can be online uh, at the national or regional platform and these it's really about uh, uh, enabling activities. So networking, uh, develop exchanging knowledge on best practices, um, a, a project design, a community involvement, best practices on the, these things, but also to list ongoing projects and research and aligning efforts between the projects that are going on. There's also um, uh, um, regular offline events can help to facilitate this, of course. What's good to notice is that there usually are already existing um, platforms and networks uh, more locally or on a specific topic. And it's good to really connect to the existing ones or to make connections between existing ones to really get this exchange going. The second, uh, let's say, overarching team with two recommendations is integrating citizen science and policy. Now we come really to more of the interaction. Um, and uh, it's uh, the third recommendation is promoting and creating awareness of how citizen science can be used in policy to convince policymakers to adopt also citizen science. Um, and this can be done by promoting and creating awareness uh, uh, by disseminating also knowledge, stories, examples, uh, and, and these have to make explicit which policy levels and also departments can make use of citizen science and what the benefits and challenges are when doing so, really providing these examples. Uh, so these can uh, uh, highlight be best practices, uh, the different types of policy questions that have been answered already or can be answered by using citizen science. And it can also be done very practically. So how you can do this is also by making a central connection point across departments within the government, which have oversight and, and can create synergies between uh, uh, well efforts on citizen science, promoting connections, maybe direct even fund uh, citizen science from the government um, and link with public engagement activities also from the government. And this is this recommendation is more for the, let's say, for people within the policy domain. So the fourth uh, recommendation in this um, um, in this one is um, establishing an open data platform to share and also um, integrate science data to inform policy and establish it as a legitimate, let's say, source uh, uh, or policy mechanism. So such an open data platform can integrate and also sort data streams resulting from the citizen science into existing standards that are there uh, in policy. And this helps really to uh, 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 citizen science as a method to inform policy uh, objectives um, and it also can help in exchanging best data practices or making data standards. And an interesting how-to here is um, uh, what came out is that that also semi-public organized independent scientific organizations like a national uh, statistical bureau or an institute for the environment or public health can be explicitly involved as a third party in this exchange to validate citizen science data and thereby also providing some sort of quality stamp of that the data that come out um, really uh, uh, are legitimate. Um, so it helps the legitimacy of citizen science um, and to embed it as a uh, evidence-based uh, uh, policy practice. Okay, the last two, and then uh, I think my time is really running up. Um, the last two are about creating collaboration between citizen science and policy. And, and the first recommendation there is really to take time to co-create uh, when you, uh, to co-create shared goals, uh, expectations, standards when using citizen science and policy. Um, and also to create co-ownership and alignment of efforts. This is really when you work together uh, when, uh, with, with, with citizen science and policy actors. What's really important is that you have a mutual understanding of each other, of the, of the common problem, 
but also that there is trust in the collaboration. Um, and what helps, uh, so how to do this is also to create a common language, um, a, a common framework like the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals can help to do this, um, but, al but also have to really have explicit expectations, uh, goals, policy objectives that you state at the start of such a project and exchange. Um, it helps to be a bit flexible, make topics relatable for individual interests, but also citizen leadership. Um, and sometimes it can help for the government to uh, label it as an experiment to allow for space and develop new forms of collaborations and methods. And the last one is to develop a local platform to connect policymakers with citizen science actors and other stakeholders to exchange um, well, questions, initiatives and needs. Um, so where the former platform was really more in, in bringing the citizen science together, this is really to integrate to, to the two. Um, so really, um, uh, well, have advocates in different from different departments, from different citizen science platforms to work here together. And this exchange in this local platform can also work as some kind of marketplace where questions from both sides uh, can be put uh, out there, but also where initiatives and needs from both parties can be exchanged. So from a policymaker's perspective, that could be governmental planning, priorities and policies, um, but also services and budgets that they have available. And from the citizen science side or science side, this could be to share priorities, needs, and questions um, with the knowledge also and services that they can provide. And this really can help to open policy, but also to adopt citizen science as a tool for active citizenship. Uh, and here also the how-to can be to really connect it to existing public institutions that already have this scientific link and are embedded in the local context, like libraries, um, perhaps museums, uh, universities, and sometimes also public schools. Really the last slide, here's the overview of these, well, six different ones. We, uh, I'm really happy that we can also exchange this with you in the breakouts in the second hour. Um, but what's next? Well, we have the breakouts, we will then discuss and, and, and also uh, uh, ask you for enriching them. Um, and based on your input, we will finalize the recommendations and then publish both the local and the cross-cutting recommendations. Um, Follow our socials, uh, our website for the publication that we will have in, in January on this. Um, and I also share the publication also via email with the people that joined one of the country masterclasses. There was a lot. Thank you very much also for uh, give, having the opportunity to exchange this. Um, I saw that there were some questions already, Anneli. Thanks, Ineos. Thanks so much for sharing. I think uh, we might need to save the questions for the breakouts where we'll have a lot of time to discuss. Um, we're running a little bit uh, over time. So I think I'll just go and uh, introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Molly Latham. She works at Earthwatch Europe. Um, and as such, in that capacity, also is part of the EU Citizen Science uh, Project. Um, so Molly, please um, go ahead and share your insights. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining today. I'm Molly and I'm a learning coordinator at Earthwatch Europe. Um, and I've collaborated closely um, as part of the EU Citizen Science Project um, on our work focused around awareness and engagement of the public and of policymakers. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so our work has focused primarily on developing a model for raising awareness of citizen science um, and engaging audiences with citizen science projects, activities and initiatives. Um, and we've utilised the expertise of the partners and the third parties, as well as existing and ongoing activities to de demonstrate how the project can provoke um, extensive and long-term broad participation across Europe with citizen science. Um, and this model um, that we've developed over the course of the project um, has been outputted primarily through the creation of two key reports. Next slide, please. Um, so the two reports that we've developed have had two broad topics of focus. Uh, the first being raising awareness of citizen science among a variation of audiences, um, and the second around increasing engagement with projects and initiatives. Um, and both reports have really uh, centred around providing guidance and concrete assistance for practitioners 
um, on how to improve the awareness and engagement in citizen science through these existing activities and also through new initiatives as well. So we provide guidance for people at varying stages um, of citizen science initiatives. Um, the key focus of both of these reports was around um, a list of recommendations. Um, so there was a respective list of 16 recommendations around engagement um, when participating in citizen science and 12 recommendations on how to raise awareness of citizen science. Um, and these recommendations really aim to provide tangible actions for practitioners to take away um, and utilize within their work. Um, and they're supported by case studies of other initiatives that have utilized the respective actions. Um, all of these recommendations are then applied to relevant target audiences with a designated section within each report on guidance for policymaker engagement and awareness raising. And essentially what these recommendations aim to do is provide a framework that practitioners can use to improve the levels of engagement and awareness around their activities uh, and initiatives. Next slide, please. So the key focus of the model and subsequently the work that Earthwatch has done is to develop tools and strategies uh, specifically fo focusing around the engagement of policymakers and raising awareness of citizen science um, in policymaker um, environments as well. Um, so the reports that we've created, as mentioned, reinforce the policymakers' roles of, sort of facilitating, translating and communicating citizen science to inform societal action. Um, and we've drawn a real focus on this in the two reports that we developed and also in the recommendations. But in addition to the recommendations that we've provided, our reports designated substantial research, collaboration and guidance to contribute to the information base surrounding policymaker engagement. Um, and that really had the two main focuses. So um, a list of extracted, refined and tailored recommendations that focus specifically on policymakers and utilised case studies that had engaged policymakers but then also a piece of work around the challenges that citizen science practitioners face when trying to engage policymakers with citizen science. Um, so we worked collaboratively, collaboratively with the consortium to identify 14 individual challenges um, that they themselves had reflected upon and found um, when engaging, when, when attempting to engage policymakers with citizen science. Um, and these ranged from concerns surrounding data quality to issues establishing and maintaining communication um, and how to sustain engagement throughout the length of the project, opposed to sort of one off touch points um, and very surface level um, amounts of engagement. Um, these challenges were identified as significant barriers to engagement um, and to engaging policymakers with the work that citizen science practitioners do. Um, and a key aspect of um, identifying these challenges was then focused on addressing these challenges as well. So again, um, in collaboration with the consortium, we worked to create tangible and applicable solutions to the 14 challenges that we identified. And this really created a framework that practitioners could take and extract from the report and use that would allow them to consider the challenges they may encounter or have already encountered, but then also look at the tangible solutions to um, formulate practical action for how they can overcome the challenges and involve policymakers with their work. Next slide, please. Um, so while the project is due to end in December, um, some key uh, outputs that we want to finalise will include condensing the reports um, into a more digestible format and a more user-friendly format um, and creating a document that will be hosted on the platform um, which will encompass the um, different recommendations that we make surrounding engagement and awareness um, so that people can use them in the design and development of their projects. 
but then also to create uh, stakeholder specific documents that summarize the research that we've done both around the recommendations and also the challenges and solutions um, and present those in stakeholder specific environments. So what we will do is focus first on policymakers and the public um, and we will develop um, a suite of case studies and recommendations and guidance specific for those audiences so that citizen science practitioners who have identified their target audiences can then utilise those documents to improve engagement and raise awareness of the work that they are doing. Next slide, please. So I want to say a huge thank you um, for attending the, speak the talk today. Um, we really appreciate your, your time. Um, and if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer those now. Thank you, Molly, uh, so much for giving an overview of uh, all the things you've done in uh, in the EU Citizen Science Project um, from uh, on the policy uh, topics. Um, I see there's been a lot, we have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, I see there's been quite a lively discussion on um, creating new platforms versus uh, keeping old ones going as a um, way of keeping uh, this data alive. Um, but that doesn't relate necessarily directly to your um, presentation. So I'd invite also other people to ask questions uh, to Molly. Um, I mean, one question I've already seen is, please, can you share uh, the reports? Because people seem to be very interested in them. And uh, your colleague, uh, Antonella, has already shared the links. So I think people will uh, engage with them um, much more. Um, but um, perhaps I can start uh, with a question as well. Um, and that is, um, I mean, what do you, if you have to name one thing in, in how do you talk to policymakers? Like at, you're a citizen science project, you have amazing data um, and you think this is super relevant for policymakers. Um, how do you go about uh, and do that? And what are the, maybe the main barriers uh, for talking to someone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was something that we discussed quite extensively when we developed the challenges versus solutions piece. Um, I think a lot of people raised significant issues with establishing that first point of contact um, or maintaining contact, particularly with um, the quite dynamic nature of the role of a lot of people in the policy sphere. Um, you know, job roles changing, people are very busy. Um, so that actually encompasses a couple of the, the challenges that we um, really identified when we worked with the groups. Um, but a lot of the solution is encompassed within the recommendations. So I would absolutely recommend anybody who is looking for guidance to have a look at both of the reports. Um, but a lot of the um, people that we spoke to really identified the importance of communicating among networks um, and seeing if particular organisations or people are aware of upcoming events or policy concerns. Um, engaging with local national representatives, um, so local councillors and reaching out to other policymakers through them. Um, collaboration between yourself and other NGOs, other citizen science projects, other organisations. Um, and also, wherever possible, ensuring that uh, communication is developed within the design of the project um, so that ample time is allowed um, and that there could potentially be somebody who is uh, I suppose responsible for that, for maintaining that relationship. Um, but that sort of just touches the surface of the guidance that we've, we've created. Um, and those were the key um, points that we drew out from the experiences of the consortium that we worked with. Right, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying it actually, um, it needs quite a bit of time to actually find the right sources and to, to establish that network where you know which policymaker is working on what uh, and how to talk to them uh, as well. Yeah. And I can imagine it can get frustrating for some, uh, some citizens or uh, citizen science projects. Do you have any um, advice on how to deal with that frustration, perhaps? 
Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so that, was, that, <laughs> that was something else that was was very much touched upon is that um, it can be a very difficult relationship to establish and to maintain um, and that there are a, a range of challenges that are associated, particularly around ensuring that timelines um, align, you know, um, ensuring that there's appropriate staff timing um, and budget to make sure that there's time to, to sort of really establish that communication, um, but also in maintaining conversations and engagement beyond sort of an initial interest. Um, so in terms of frustrations, I suppose um, there's no real one way to, to mitigate that frustration. Um, but absolutely, I think collaborative work on, on this issue is really important. Um, utilizing the resource that you have available um, so, for example, um, reports such as this one that provide um, sort of tailored guidance around a specific audience type as well. Um, definitely um, sort of finding people from the community who have perhaps already had experience and can perhaps share what their experience was and sort of sympathise with the process. Um, yeah, I think yeah. those were the really key ways that we identified. Great. Yeah, and I think as now we often feel like we're kind of wading through the forest a little bit still. And hopefully, you know, uh, in the future, if we work more on this interaction between citizen science and policy, it'll actually be easier for, you know, next generations to uh, to talk to policymakers. So, um, but thank you so much for uh, your presentation and also your answers um, to the questions. Thank you. Um, we will now uh, move to the next presentation uh, given by Silke Voigt-Heuke. Um, she's a researcher at the um, Museum für Naturkunde. And uh, as some of you uh, have seen her um, much more in this event, uh, she's also uh, one of the coordinators of the EU Citizen Science Project. Um, so Silke, uh, please go ahead and uh, share your presentation with us. Yeah, thanks so much, Anneli, for the nice introduction. I'm uh, really happy to be here today at the masterclass. I will not be talking about the EU Citizen Science Project, uh, but uh, I will introduce you to a conference that we gave last year in Berlin, the Citizen Science SDG Conference. And one of the major outcomes of the conference was a declaration that was termed Our World, Our Goals, Citizen Science for the Sustainable Development Goals. So to give you some background about the conference, the conference was part of the German EU presidency in 2020 and was funded by the European Commission. Um, so we were already very much connected to policy with the conference itself. And of course, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals themselves are also a political aim uh, that we all hopefully would like to thrive um, to achieve and implement at some point. Um, so uh, the conference had the idea to connect many actors in the field of citizen science and doing so, we worked really closely with six partners um, that helped us to um, make the conference the success that it became in the end. So the conference itself um, had three different themes, all under the guidance of citizen science and the SDGs. And in total, we had 81 presentations in 18 sessions, 50 e-posters with five visionary plenary talks, two panel discussions, and also one amazing evening event. And um, the conference was attended by almost 500 people in total online, but on site, they were we were able to host um, around 60, 70 people that uh, due to the uh, corona measures that were in place also in Berlin last year, still in place or again in place. Um, so we had a hybrid conference in the end, uh, but it turned out to be really nice. And if any of you are interested in the conference, please feel free to um, watch the conference and the outcome of the different sessions on the MFN YouTube um, channel. So we do have all webinars or all sessions there online for you to rewatch and also to share with your local communities. 
There are also some really, really interesting sessions uh, that also touch policy. Um, for example, also Linton Ferrer and Michael Antoff from the European Commission um, were able uh, to attend the CSSDG conference and um, uh, answered many, many questions and interested questions um, in um, the expert session at the conference. But one major outcome of the conference was not also the content of the sessions, but the declaration. And the declaration was actually developed beforehand of the conference in an open and participatory process. So actually it was a result and a product of a co-creation process. And also the name, Our World, Our Goals, Citizen Science for the SDGs was found in a co-creation process. So in our different sessions, we um, had ideas and uh, we shared ideas how to name the um, conference, uh, how the, to name the declaration, and um, the title was actually voted on. But what actually is a declaration and um, how does this declaration work? And this was a process that was um, quite uh, difficult to think through because we wanted to take everybody along. Um, obviously, a declaration is also a political tool and um, citizen science engages many, many different actors, uh, more practitioners, uh, more academics. And um, so we had to really be careful to take everybody along. And how we did this and how we thought this through, I would like to share with you now. And the first step that we had was that we invited Sticky Dot, who are also today hosting us um, with this conference here, or with the masterclass, um, to evaluate the process of the declaration, also the conference, but also the declaration process, because we wanted to understand in the end whether we had met the expectation of the community. So what were the expectations towards the declaration? So I have chosen three different comments here. The first one is that um, people commented that the expectation is that the declaration should raise awareness amongst various stakeholders, for example, the media, policymakers, and also scientists. And one more expectation was, for example, that the declaration could become a milestone or a benchmark for the citizen science community so that the community has um, some kind benchmark to use to orientate. But of course, there were also other voices um, that we tried to take serious. So for example, it uh, was raised that this will be just one more declaration. So a declaration sounds nice, but it's really nothing new and nothing new follows from it. So what is important is um, about this declaration might be that it can point and show a direction to what policymakers should go. So it's rather a point of reference for policymakers, but the declaration itself might not be that new. And I will share later with you uh, whether these expectations um, were actually met. So as this graph might be a bit difficult for you to read, I will try to guide you through it. So our idea was um, to create this declaration. Uh, we need to partner up with many, many actors in the field of citizen science. So as I've told you in the beginning, we had six different partners um, that partnered up uh, with us um, to also go this road towards the declaration. And one, for example, was EXA, which is a great actor, a societal actor um, to also act um, as a connecting point for the declaration. So we partnered up with many, many people to create a starting point. And we initiated four different virtual meetings. And in those four different virtual meetings, uh, we invited everybody um, that wanted to come. It, those were open meetings. And um, the invitation for these meetings was shared via the conference newsletter, was shared via social media by the social media channels of EXA and also via the EXA newsletter. So we were really open for people to come and join us in creating this declaration. And in the first stepping stones, we we're really thinking about um, what aims this declaration has and what potential in, uh, impacts it could have. And 
In the second meeting, we discussed what is actually a declaration and how do we declare this declaration, who is addressed to. In a third meeting, we actually discussed more content-wise the meaningfulness of our statements and um, we're working on the terminology. And in the fourth meeting, we were thinking about how can we actually implement these goals. And in between every of those meetings, we double checked with the conference program committee that was um, um, uh, where uh, different experts were invited to be part of and uh, discussed the outcomes that we had in the virtual meetings. So after four virtual meetings that were hosted by AXA, we um, came together, had a draft of the declaration, and um, this was actually then co-edited in an open process. So we had an open Google document where people could work on, and in the end had a draft that then at the CSSUG conference was uh, declared, and um, people were then able to actually individually or sign as an organization or institution um, to legitimize this declaration. And the final step was, of course, that the declaration was officially shared with the European Commission and now has been able or has been used um, to impact policy. And also here again, I would like to invite you, if you are more interested, to better understand how the seminars went and how the virtual meetings uh, actually work, to go on the EXA YouTube channel to have a look at the four different meetings that are online there. So what does the declaration actually say? So I'm trying to now briefly go through the most important points of the declaration with you. And I think they very much um, reflect what has been talked about today already in, um, by the speakers um, that uh, were before me. So the first is, who is the declaration actually addressed to? So we, the authors, so the citizen science SDG community, a very wide and um, variable community of stakeholders, called upon European institutions, EU member states, their research and innovation funding and performing organizations um, to take along our recommendations of this declaration. So the declaration was a declaration from the community to policymakers. And we had three main pillars of our uh, within our declaration with recommendation. So the first recommendation was to actually harness the benefits of citizen science for the SDGs. And we had three different points here, and um, I'll try to briefly guide you through this. So the first one was that we actually recommended that citizens must be supported and actually encouraged to create new citizen science knowledge to support the SDGs. And of course, this can only be done in collaboration with policymakers, academia, research institutions, and so on. The second point here was that, however, to do so, academia and universities and research institutions must in this process be actually be supported to restructure, to be open to practice open science measures, to be open for participation and dialogue. And of course, to do so, we do need funding. So the third recommendation here was that policymakers and research funders should actually provide strategic and also financial support to act as a change agent. The second major pillar of our recommendations was to strengthen citizen science and its connection with other communities. So what we recommended as authors was that citizen science network and communities must interact more closely to form synergies. And what also should be promoted is that systems should be established to increase these exchanges and coordinations, because we notice that there are many different communities, many different actors, but what we need to do is to unite, to be strong together. And to really ensure that this system change is been done effectively, we recommended that every citizen science actor should do so transparently. And we try to do so in the process of the declaration ourselves. 
And uh, last but not least, under this pillar, um, of course, we uh, recommended that data management and data sharing principles should also be used in the citizen science SDG community. And coming to the third pillar, which is really the future. So our recommendation was to strengthen future citizen science system. And to do so, the first thing is to mainstream citizen science across the new Horizon Europe framework program. And we think this actually has been taking along. And we do see that citizen science is blossoming in European funding schemes. So we're really happy to see this um, coming and taking up. And uh, we hope that every recommendation that comes out of declar declarations, of masterclasses, of policy initiatives actually help to strengthen this pillar. And last but not least, uh, we recommended that curricula, be it in schools, be it in, uh, in universities, should actually relate to citizen science and the SDGs. And this should be taken um, along uh, more into the educational systems. And again, to do so, of course, we need to better understand what um, the benefits are of citizen science what is the added value of citizen science? And for this, we recommended funding for research into the science of citizen science to better understand how citizen science works, what are its added values, and to actually show this in a scientific and evidence-based way. And last but not least, we are cautious and we recommended that citizen science has also special requirements. It's not standard science, and we should take this along when we fund citizen science projects and aim to change science systems. And one different route, um, contrasting traditional um, scientific funding schemes where novel science is funded, could be that we could explore more the upscaling of uh, projects and to invest more in long-term sustainability initiatives for social change. So these were the recommendations of the declaration. And now I would like to share some figures who actually um, made this happen. So in total, over 60 authors from all over Europe actually worked on creating this declaration and participated in the writing and editing process. And in the end, a total of 290 individuals um, during the time where it was open and promoted um, signed off the declaration uh, to make it legitimate and um, actually uh, make yeah made it uh, heard um, towards the policymakers that we uh, addressed it to. And what I would like to share is that it is still possible to sign the declaration. Uh, so I invite you to follow the link below um, if you would like to put your signature um, below the declaration. There's also a long list of names. So. Um, uh, so you can also have a look who has already signed the declaration by now. And were the expectations actually met? Um, so I've taken out one figure here. Um, Sticky Dot performed a really nice evaluation of the process in the conference. Um, it's actually a deliverable of the conference. So who is interested can find it in Sunodo. And uh, what we can see here um, was the evaluation on how these virtual meetings worked. Uh, did people feel that the expectations on the meetings, on the transparency of the process was actually met? And um, you can see three different ratings here in blue, um, whether people agree with the statement, in gray, whether they disagree, and in orange, um, neither disagree or agree. And um, I just want to pick out um, two things. Uh, so the second point, my views have changed thanks to the virtual meetings of the declaration process. So most people stated that their views haven't really changed, uh, which um, uh, hopefully is uh, not surprising to most of you because the people that came to the meetings that supported the declaration, of course, uh, were very much fans uh, or are very um, much enthusiastic about citizen science. Um, so they came there to make their voice heard. But um, picking out um, the third uh, point um, from the bottom, I learned things during the virtual meetings. Nevertheless, people stated that mostly they actually learned something. And I think this is about uh, this mutual uh, learning experience that people have. And I think it's very much worth having those transparent and open meetings, bottom up 
co-creation of processes also in policy um, so that people can share and uh, experience the process themselves and be part of it. So this is why the very last point, I enjoyed the virtual meetings. Most people, uh, albeit uh, the process might be difficult and also, you know, very nitty about little things sometimes, wording and um, how the process was shaped. Most people actually enjoyed being part of the, um, this process in creating the declaration. So what's next? So of course, right now we're still in the process of disseminating the declaration across the EXA networks and um, also you can be part of this. Um, we want uh, the declaration to be used um, as a tool for policymakers for policy. And part of this that we are still in the process of um, making a final publication of the CSSDG conference with a brochure. And also here, the declaration will be highlighted and also this transparent and open development process. And we hope it's coming soon, um, hopefully in the next, la la next four weeks. And uh, oh. the last step is that we are exploring the possibility of reviewing the implementation um, of uh, the declaration in an open consultation process in the future. And with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, the whole CSSDG team and, of course, you for listening. And uh, I think we have no time for questions, but I'm really happy to answer your questions later on in the chat. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this, uh, Silke, for sharing the process as well as the content of the declaration. Um, I must say I was able to attend uh, one of the meetings and it definitely put uh, the SDGs and that possibility to use the SDGs as a linking mechanism for policy and citizen science uh, in my mind and it definitely uh, stuck with me. Um, so, so thank you so much for that. Um, indeed, we don't really have much time for questions right now um, as we're going to move into the breakout uh, uh, rooms. So you'll find these uh, six uh, breakout rooms in the sessions on the left hand side of your screen. You can choose your favorite one. Um, perhaps if you see one is not so popular, um, you know, you might want to consider going into that one and not to leave the moderator all alone. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, please uh, join one of these sessions and we will be back. Uh, I'll say we'll move back around uh, 3.35 and then uh, really start the plenary interaction again um, at 3.40. Um, so please uh, stay tuned for that as well. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome back. I hope you had some nice discussions uh, talking about your favorite um, recommendation. Um, hi also uh, to Inyo uh, again. Um, so to um, kind of have a feel of what just happened uh, in the breakout rooms, we have a, uh, a poll again. Um, so go and head on to um, the um, uh, polls. So if you click on the right side, you first on the top, you have to click on stage. And then below that, there's polls. Uh, and if all goes right, um, you should see um, the new question. Um, and the first one is, uh, well, which recommendation can you actually contribute to in your own work? So now we've discussed what, what do they mean? Or should they be sharpened, etc. But what do you think you can do? I mean, uh, maybe you think you're powerless, but I don't think so. Um, I think and, you and can also also only choose one. So, so your main one where you yeah, think you the can main one. contribute to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I can see you're answering the poll. Yeah, can you see the answers now? Yeah, I found a loophole. <laughs> I just logged. I just logged in as well, so to see what people say. I think it's quite exactly. scattered, right? So pe people. It's very scattered. I mean, yeah. the favorite so far seems to be to set up a national or regional citizen science network. Six people want to uh, contribute to that, uh, and I think the least 
popular sort of one that people feel that they wouldn't be able to do is to develop a local platform um, for exchange. Um, so thanks for that. Um, and then the next question, because um, there's not only, only you working on these things, but which recommendation do you feel like is most important for other people to work on? So maybe you won't be able to influence this, but what do you think other people in your ecosystem should um, should do, really? See some of the votes coming in. Seems like it's still very important for people to promote citizen science as relevant for policy, to so to create these narratives and to keep like pushing these examples of, of how citizen science has been relevant for, for policy. Oh no, now I see a clear favorite in funding, <laughs> which in a way is unsurprising um, that uh, other people should just uh, give more money. Uh, to uh, citizen science. And I mean, I concur with that. It's uh, it's very important. And without money, we can't um, do all these amazing uh, projects. Um, so thanks. Thanks for voting. Um, and as a last uh, question for the audience, um, I would like to ask you to share, um, have you had any eye openers uh, during this workshop? Um, something someone else has said that you thought was really, really good, um, or perhaps something you have said in the breakout rooms that you'd like to share um, with the rest uh, of the audience. Um, so go on over and go to the chat this time. So it's not a poll because we want to give not only multiple choice, but a real um, open question. What um, yeah, what do you think the most important takeaways have been from, from this workshop? So I see already some of you have commented. Um, Sabina, indeed, in the Netherlands, uh, under the wings of Enfos, uh, citizen science platform is being created as we speak. Um, so that's really exciting. And uh, Silke also shares that publishing in scientific journals uh, with and in the field um, of citizen science to prove critics wrong is also important. I wonder if critics would actually read uh, citizen science if they're that critical, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. I think it is uh, very important to keep spreading positive uh, news on uh, how citizen science has been able to work. Um, keep adding uh, your, uh, your posts. Um, as we go, um, but uh, maybe first also to Inyo, um, were there any things in, in your breakout group that, that you think you would uh, take away from, from this? Well, I, I was, I was, um, I was there with, with only one participant, um, with uh, Dr. Riemenschneider. Um, and, but I, I loved what, what also, um, Gefian just shared in the chat. So I was in the last, um, recommendation on develop a local uh, uh, platform for exchange um, that um, Gefian shared. Well, that I think developing a local platform may be something that many of us do in addition to something else. So I think it's more something that you also do by in your local context, whether it's regional or more in a national platform, um, is something you try to develop, um, as Sabine is also sharing in the Netherlands, that you do alongside your citizen science work or alongside uh, maybe making these interactions. Um, I think we really talked about what was interesting, I think, for any exchange, whether it's between citizen scientists or whether it's between citizen scientists and also policymakers, is um, that it takes, I think, a lot of effort and, and constant uh, interaction with the, well, with the network or networks you're in, with the ecosystem, 
because it's usually not just one network with a lot of different ecosystems as also uh, she shared. Um, and, and it needs some constant interaction. So she shared uh, stories about development of the EU citizen science platform, which is an interesting platform where they also really try to connect to the national ones, but also maybe in the end also with regional ones. Um, but it takes time um, and, and it takes time also to get this exchange going. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that was also a kind of the gist of what Molly was uh, telling us in her uh, presentation. So there's uh, still a lot of work to do in that sense. However, also a positive note from, from the chat uh, by Lyndon Ferrer, uh, who says that next networks and practice of citizen science is definitely already strengthening uh, across the EU. Um, well, I'm coming from someone who works uh, with the European Commission. I think that's definitely uh, an important uh, note. Um, I see some more comments um, coming in uh, from Sarah uh, Spargo. It's important to build an EU-based legal framework for including citizen science and policy making. Um, this was underlined by Dilek uh, in our session, definitely. Um, but I've also experienced this in my work as a community steward in citizen science. Uh, the legal recognition is very important to the committed citizen scientists I work with. I guess that's also a kind of recognition uh, of their work. Um, and legitimization is also underneath, uh, I think, underlying what Sarah is saying. I'm not sure whether it is, but also for the citizen science themselves, that they, that they are recognized uh, and seen as a legitimate source of their work, what they're doing, because otherwise it's also yeah, hard to contribute, of course. Uh, but also by yeah. policy to 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 see be seen as a legitimate source or legitimate uh, uh, methodology let's say yeah absolutely yeah yeah so legal frameworks i think is one one way of doing that i think one good practice in this collaboration with citizen scientists is always to be very transparent about uh, the connection to policy like if there are any ways of influencing policy you should be uh, yeah sort of clear about this uh, from the start so that the expectations uh, back in back in pro are, are always clear. Um, Muki Heckley shares that there will actually be a new journal coming out um, on community cool. science, which demonstrates mainstreaming in traditional areas of science. Oh, that sounds very um, exciting, and that is actually a piece of evidence, I guess, for uh, Lyndon's uh, comment earlier. Yeah. What was I think also very interesting from the from the poll, the first poll is is you know on the which recommendation uh, can people also work on themselves that it was really scattered. So probably people also chose the breakout room maybe there where they thought well I can do something with this or I'm interested in really working on this. Uh, but then in, in what others should do is really also to provide more funding, which is um, I think we saw in the in the start that there are uh, more let's say uh, people from the science and the citizen science community um uh that makes sense uh but it's interesting i, I also see that many people said that, uh, that what, what is needed to promote citizen science is relevant for policy um and and taking time for co-creation were also two that got quite some votes so it's 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 also really about showing the importance to policy and making connections uh, but it's also about adopting new practices um and taking time for this co-creation um, which also i think connects to what i shared before on, on that Developing platforms and developing exchange really take time and and um, are hard to do, um, and and we have to have maybe some patience in how fast we can move to really get this uh, integrated also uh, in policy. Absolutely, and in that sense, it's it's a it's a long term uh, project, and I also just. Um, before uh, really closing this event, I just wanted to share also from from my breakout session that. Uh, someone shared that in, in some parts of Eastern Europe, also citizen science as a practice isn't even recognized as such so much. It's not even a real kind of um, well-known uh, research practice. So what could help there is, is if there is funding for, um, for citizen science to be used in the science system, then actually that recognition can be boosted and, and scientists who are in some ways maybe more keen to involve citizen science um, can actually do so. Um, so that was a, a nice insight also in, you know, because our uh, masterclasses, uh, yeah, we're not so much in the Eastern European context. So 
I think uh, what was interesting, um, it's not in the, let's say the cross-cutting uh, um, recommendations that we did, but but in many, let's say specific country uh, recommendations, there are parts also on the diversity and, and the importance of getting diverse actors, both in citizen science involved, but also um, that it can be really strong if you have a diverse, uh, uh, well, interaction with, with citizen scientists. Uh, it can be a very strong message uh, and a very strong tool for policy to also engage with uh, underrepresented communities that are not usually also engaged with policy in, in let's say participation or participatory tra trajectories so citizen science is also a tool there really to um, put the um, to uh, how to let's say in increase diversity and uh, connect with the diversity of actors for policy absolutely yeah um as we're going towards the end. I'd like to share uh, a slide um, just about where can we go now, basically. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so, I mean, action's coming to a close. EU citizen science is coming to a close. But of course, citizen science uh, as a community is, is not going anywhere. And as we've seen in this conference, actually, it's been a really wonderful community, uh, lots of interaction. Um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight a few initiatives that, that we know that we've come across, uh, and I'm sure Excel will actually know more as I think someone posted in the chat. Um, so in terms of real networks, we see that on a European or global level, um, Excel, of course, um, and the EU citizen science platform, as well as on a global scale, there is citizenscienceglobal.org. Um, and in a moment, I'd like to invite Silke to actually expand a little bit on the EU citizen science uh, platform. Um, but first, also, there's national or regional level um, citizen science networks. So some of them are only just now beginning to be established, uh, such as in the Netherlands, such as in Norway and Italy. Um, and others have been going uh, for a bit longer, like in Belgium or um, Denmark, I believe. Um, so these are some links um, to these uh, national or regional level um, networks that you can uh, connect to to continue this work. Um, and if you are here at Silke, I would love uh, for you to give also a few words on what exactly um, there is uh, for policymakers in the EU citizen science platform and how you think we can continue um, this work. Okay, Silke is not there. She uh, didn't make her way to the backstage. Um, oh, great. It's been such a maze of trying to find our way to front stage and backstage, but uh, I'm glad you uh, you found your way. Um, so just if you could briefly share uh, perhaps uh, the platform. I mean, we talked about it, of course, uh, throughout the last two days, but maybe more specifically, how do you think it can help us stay connected in terms of policy and creating policy change and um, maybe improving the relationship between policy and uh, citizen science? Yeah, thanks so much, Anadi. So I hope by now everybody knows EU citizen science um, as an online resource. And um, of course, I think um, the first um, thing that we have to mention is that the idea is that EU citizen science is a platform that was really created by the community for the community. So in the creation itself and what um, featured it has, it actually reflects the needs of the community. And with community, we also, of course, mean the ecosystem of policymakers that are part of uh, citizen science community. Um, so uh, for one, I think um, citizen science, EU citizen science uh, really is a reference point for both policymakers and um, citizen scientists actors um, uh, regarding to res the resource section that we have. Uh, there are many excellent resources that um, both policymakers and citizen scientists um, enthusiasts can use um, to really strengthen um, their arguments uh, why there is an added value in citizen science um, to use it uh, for evidence-based recommendations. So I think um, here it really provides an excellent 
reference points. And secondly, of course, um, it really makes it easy for people to connect because there's this personal section where people can create profiles. There's a community forum, so it's really easy to see and find out who um, is active in what field, um, which actors are there. Um, it makes it easier for people to connect. And that's also why, again, I would really very much invite everybody to also use this opportunity um, to become active at this stage and um, make use of the resources. Um, it's it's for you. It's not. Uh, it's it's made for the community, and we really invite everybody to use it. And um, secondly, what I think is very strong about EU citizen science is that we have created EU citizen science um, as a reference point um, for citizen science that is now going to be handed over to AXA. And um, I do know that AXA has um, really amazing plans um, how to transform EU citizen science into e even more, uh, let's say, collaborative tool um, to get the AXA community more um, connected to the EU citizen science community and find synergies here. Um, so I think um, for policymakers and citizen science practitioners, it will become even more easier um, to use the platform as um, a point of connection. Um, so I think that's why it's also um, so important um, to connect via those online platforms and really make use of them as a tool, as we have already mentioned, um, as uh, a meeting point, as a place where to find your community, see who is in the community, what the community is doing. So I invite everybody really to make use of all these resources and um, and get a profile, uh, get online and become part of one of the EXA working groups um, to be part of the community and be an active voice in formulating your needs and your interests um, for and in citizen science. Thank you so much, uh, Silke, for that uh, elaboration. Um, and I think, um, I mean, there's more resources being posted in the chat, so definitely um, keep an eye on that. Um, thanks for that. And uh, with that, maybe, I think... Yeah. yeah, maybe, Anneli, before you close, can I maybe say, say one last thing? Because I really, I think we've been talking about, you know, creating platforms for exchange uh, within the citizen science community. Uh, we've also talked about platform for exchange more with policymakers and what i really see and that of course that has been also these these past well let's say two days but also the past two hours we really uh, have formed this kind of exchange and i think um we now have to think about how to really also engage i mean there's a lot of willingness there are so many recommendations great recommendations on how to do it there's so much knowledge out here and i think what, what the next step would be is to really get also, uh, let's say, the policy side more engaged to experiment with really doing that engagement, not only, let's say, having these recommendations, but also trying to implement the practice, experimenting with it, experimenting with co-creation to also uh, see, uh, well, these kind of platforms um, um, elaborating with uh, or, or expanding uh, with, uh, with also that part. Uh, and I'm really happy to see already quite some uh, a mixed group here of, of, of people, uh, but it would be great to have that, I think, expanded in the coming, let's say, years to be a bit patient to really get this going. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with that, I would uh, like to thank all participants, all speakers uh, for this really interesting um, session. And um, be well, be safe. And um, we hope to continue working um, together. Thank you very much. <laughs>